Ladies and gentlemen, Noam Chomsky. Perhaps it's a sign of my age or perhaps something else, but uh, I, can't, uh, I cannot help thinking more and more about what kind of a world uh, we're leaving for our children, grandchildren. And it's not a very pretty picture, not one that should inspire pride. There are quite a few grim shadows that hover menacingly uh, over uh, thoughts about our legacy. And of all of them, two are dominant because they literally threaten survival of the species, at least in any decent form. Uh, one is nuclear war, uh, the other is environmental disaster. And not only is nothing serious being done about these challenges, but current decisions are enhancing the threats. Uh, it should be unnecessary to tarry on environmental disasters and how the impending crisis is being handled. Uh, as for the threat of nuclear war, it's on the front pages daily, but in a way that would seem outlandish to an independent observer uh, viewing the uh, strange doings on Earth. In fact, this same independent observer uh, might wonder if we are trying to settle a uh, debate that took place some years ago between two eminent scientists, uh, uh, Carl Sagan, astrophysicist, uh, Ernst Meyer, biologist. Uh, they were debating uh, the probability of uh, intelligent extraterrestrial life. And Sagan, uh, arguing from the point of view of an astrophysicist, uh, concluded that it's very likely because there are so many planets similar enough to Earth so that uh, they could sustain life and hence evolution to higher intelligence. Uh, Ernst Mayer took the opposite view, arguing as a biologist. He said that we should pay attention to the one example we have, namely Earth. And he pointed out that uh, in the history of life on Earth, uh, there have been several billion species, uh, some successful, some not. And uh, turns out that uh, the success of a species uh, as determined by the number, of, uh, uh, the number of instances of it that survive uh, is inversely related to intelligence. So the most, most successful species are those that mutate very quickly, like bacteria, or those that have a fixed ecological niche, like beetles. Now, they do very well no matter what happens. And as you move up the scale of what we call intelligence, the survival becomes uh, much more uh, hazardous. Uh, among mammals, uh, there are actually very few of them. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of cows, but that's only because humans domesticate them, uh, just as there are a lot of chickens for the same reason. But survival on their own is that they don't do very well. When you get to primates, there are very few. Uh, humans uh, have been very sparsely, have been very sparse throughout the world until 
very recently, so recent that uh, doesn't mean anything in evolutionary terms. Uh, he also pointed out that the average life uh, expectancy for a species is roughly 100,000 years. Uh, rather ominously, that's about how long it's been that Homo sapiens has been on Earth. So his conclusion is uh, that uh, intelligence is basically a lethal mutation. Uh, as you move up to greater intelligence, there's more and more self-destruction. And it, you could, this extraterrestrial observer might argue that we're trying to prove that uh, Meyer was correct. Certainly what it looks like. Well, uh, turning to nuclear threats, the current nuclear threat, uh, not for the first time, is in the Middle East. In this case, it focuses on Iran. Uh, the general picture in the West is clear and straightforward. Uh, it is far too dangerous to allow Iran to reach what's called nuclear capability. Uh, that is, the ability to uh, create nuclear weapons if they decide to do, to, uh, to do so. That capability is enjoyed by a great many uh, countries in the world. As to whether they have decided, uh, U.S. intelligence says it doesn't know. Uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency says pretty much the same thing. In their latest report just a few weeks ago, the agency concludes, I'll quote, that it cannot demonstrate the absence of undeclared nuclear material and activities in Iran can't prove that they're not taking place. Now that's a condition that can't be satisfied, maybe conveniently. Uh, therefore, Iran must be denied the right to enrich uranium that's guaranteed by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which in fact Iran has signed, unlike three nuclear powers, uh, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Uh, that's the general picture in the West. I have to emphasize West, and not the rest of the world. The non-aligned movement, which is you know, the majority of people of the world and states of the world by far, has taken a rather different stand. You, as you know, I'm sure, it has recently met in Tehran, it's a regular meeting, and it came out with a vigorous endorsement of Iran's right to enrich uh, uranium as guaranteed by the Non-Proliferation Treaty. That's not a new position. They've been taking that position for a long time. Uh, also quite interesting is the Arab world. I'll come back to that in a moment. Well, the basic reason for the concern has been expressed succinctly by General, an American general, General Lee Butler, who's the former head of the U.S. Strategic Command, which is in charge of nuclear weapons, strategic policies involving nuclear weapons. Uh, he writes that it is dangerous in the extreme that in the cauldron of animosities that we call the Middle East, one nation should arm itself with nuclear weapons, which may inspire other nations to do so. Uh, General Butler, uh, however, was not referring to Iran. He was referring to Israel. Uh, that's the country that ranks highest in polls of European public opinion as the most dangerous country in the world, right above Iran. And not in the Arab world. In the Arab world, the public regards the United States as the second most dangerous country after Israel. That goes back quite a while. Iran is generally disliked, but it, doesn't, it ranks far lower as a threat among populations, that is, not the dictatorships. Uh, Western media and commentary keep almost entirely to the views of the dictators. So we constantly hear that the Arabs want decisive uh, U.S. action against Iran, which is true of the dictators. Uh, you may recall that a little while ago, uh, WikiLeaks uh, released uh, 
uh, diplomatic documents uh, quoting uh, Arab dictators, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, uh, as calling for strong U.S. action against Iran. And the commentary about that was interesting. It was almost euphoric. Uh, uh, isn't this wonderful? The Arabs uh, support uh, uh, U.S. policy against Iran, which is true of the Arab dictators. At the very same time, Western polls were coming out, Western-run polls, showing that it's quite the opposite, that uh, uh, though, again, they don't like Iran, uh, they're not regarded as a threat. The United States is regarded as a threat. And in fact, opposition to U.S. policy was so strong that uh, a majority in some countries like Egypt, a substantial majority, thought that the region would be more secure if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, they don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, but if the United States and Israel are, uh, have them and are there, that's what's needed. Uh, that, that was almost never mentioned. And that reaction is pretty striking. It illustrates the uh, contempt for democracy among Western, in Western elite opinion. Doesn't matter what the population thinks. That's derided as the Arab street. Who cares what they think? And what matters is what the dictators think. It's a commentary about us, not about the Arab world. Well, unlike Iran, uh, Israel refuses to allow inspections, refuses to join the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, it has hundreds of nuclear weapons and advanced delivery systems. Uh, also has a long record of violence and repression. It has annexed and settled conquered territories illegally in violation of Security Council orders, uh, World Court decisions, and many acts of aggression. It's invaded Lebanon five times with no credible pretext and much more. Uh, the, uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, severe threats of attack uh, continue uh, from the United States and particularly Israel. Uh, daily there are strong threats of attack uh, and there's a reaction from the U.S. government. The Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, uh, reacted to threats from Israel by saying we don't want them to attack Iran but uh, they're a sovereign country and they can do what they like. I mean, if Iran was making comparable threats about Israel, and it isn't, uh, the reaction would be quite different. Uh, if some of you have uh, antiquarian interests, uh, you may remember that there's a document called the United Nations Charter. Uh, the key provision in the UN Charter is a ban against the threat or use of force in international affairs. Uh, there are two rogue states, uh, United States and Israel, that pay no attention to this and are constantly issuing severe threats. And the European Union goes along politely. Uh, and the threats are not just words. There is an ongoing war, or at least what we would regard as, regard as an ongoing war if it was directed against us. Uh, there are regular assassinations of uh, scientists, terrorist acts. There's a very severe economic war. Uh, U.S. threats, which are unilateral, have cut Iran out of the international financial system. The European countries don't disobey the United States, so they've gone along. Uh, five uh, uh, high-level former NATO commanders they recently released what they called a new grand strategy, which uh, identified various uh, acts of war that justify a violent response. Uh, one of them is weapons of finance. That's an act of war that justifies a military reaction when it's directed against us. But cutting Iran out of global financial markets is different. Uh, Cyber, the U.S. government is very proudly announcing that it's undertaking 
extensive uh, cyber warfare against, uh, against uh, Iran. Uh, the Pentagon has identified cyber warfare as a serious military attack which justifies our military response. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the difference between what we do to them and what they do to us. Uh, Israel has a, an enormous lethal armory, not just nuclear. Uh, only recently, in the last few months, uh, Israel has received advanced submarines provided by Germany. Uh, these are capable of carrying Israel's nuclear-tipped missiles, and they're sure to be deployed in the Persian Gulf or nearby. They may already be there, uh, certainly if Israel proceeds with its plan to bomb Iran. And the US, of course, has a vast array of nuclear weapons surrounding the region from the Indian Ocean all the way to the west. Uh, in the Persian Gulf itself, the US has enough firepower to destroy the world uh, many times over. Uh, another story that's in the news right now is the Israeli bombing of the Iraqi reactor, uh, Osirak, in 1981. And that's being presented as a, a model for Israeli bombing of Iran. It's rarely pointed out that that bombing did not end Iraq's nuclear weapons program. It initiated it. We know that even from U.S. intelligence. They didn't have, Saddam Hussein didn't have a nuclear weapons program, but after the bombing, he made sure to develop one. Uh, that was the effect of the 1981 bombing. Uh, if Iran is bombed, it's almost certain to proceed, uh, just as Saddam Hussein did uh, after the Osirak bombing. And uh, it's not a pleasant prospect. Well, in a few weeks, uh, we will be commemorating the 50th anniversary of the most dangerous moment in human history. I'm quoting the words of uh, American historian, uh, Kennedy advisor, Arthur Schlesinger. He's referring, of course, to the October 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I doubt that the commemoration will be presenting it accurately, but you should bear in mind what happened then. Uh, Kennedy raised the nuclear alert to the second highest level, uh, just short of launch. Uh, he authorized NATO, NATO aircraft with Turkish or other pilots to take off, fly to Moscow, drop bombs, which would set off a nuclear conflagration. Uh, at the peak of the missile crisis, Kennedy himself estimated the probab probability of nuclear war at uh, perhaps 50%. Uh, that would have been a war that uh, would destroy the Northern Hemisphere, President Eisenhower had warned. And facing that risk, Kennedy refused to agree publicly to an offer from Russian Prime Minister Khrushchev to end the crisis by simultaneous withdrawal of Russian missiles from Cuba and US missiles from Turkey. These were obsolete missiles. A withdrawal order had already been issued to get rid of them because they were being replaced by invulnerable uh, Polaris submarines. Nevertheless, Kennedy refused to accept the offer. It was felt necessary to firmly establish the principle that Russia has no right to have offensive weapons anywhere beyond the borders of the USSR, while the US must retain the right to have them anywhere it wants, uh, all over the world, uh, targeting Russia, or for that matter, targeting China. Uh, in, in fact, at that time, 1962, the United States had uh, just secretly deployed nuclear missiles in Okinawa, theoretically a Japanese island, but the US took it over after the Second World War as a military base against the uh, strong and continuing protest of the people of Okinawa. Uh, 
that those missiles were aimed at China at a moment of uh, serious regional tensions. That's just recently been learned. Well, fortunately, Khrushchev backed down, but the world can't be assured of such sanity forever. Uh, particularly threatening is the fact that intellectual opinion and even scholarship uh, hail Kennedy's achievement as his finest hour. I think that uh, requires some serious reflection. Uh, inability to face the truth about oneself is all too common a feature of the intellectual culture, and it has ominous implications. Well, that was 1962. Uh, ten years later, uh, during the 1973 Israel-Arab War, uh, Henry Kissinger called a high-level nuclear alert. The purpose was to warn the Russians to keep hands off uh, while he was secretly informing Israel that they were authorized to violate the ceasefire imposed by the U.S. and Russia, documents that have only recently been released. Uh, pretty serious, in fact, no reporting, of course. Uh, when Ronald Reagan came into office a few years later, the United States launched operations probing Russian defenses and simulating air and naval attacks, also placing Pershing missiles in Germany with a five-minute flight time to Russian targets that provided what the CIA called a super sudden first strike capability. Now, the Russians were naturally deeply concerned. They didn't know if these pro probing efforts probing, you know, entering Russian airspace to probe defenses and so on, and the simulation of air and naval attacks. They didn't know whether they were tests or whether they were real. They were concerned. That led to a major war scare in 1983. We came very close. Uh, there have been hundreds of cases when human intervention aborted a first nuclear strike just minutes before launch. That was when automated systems gave false alarms, as they regularly do. That's on the U.S. side. We don't have records from Russia, but there's no doubt that their systems are far more accident-prone than the same would be true of any other nuclear power. In fact, it's a near miracle that nuclear war has so far been avoided, and we are escalating the threat. Uh, meanwhile, India and Pakistan have come close to nuclear war several times, and the crises remain, mainly over Kashmir. Uh, both countries have refused to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty, along with Israel, and along with Israel, they've received a U.S. support for development of their nuclear weapons program. Uh, that's going on right now, last few years, in the case of India, uh, since it became a, a U.S. ally. Uh, today, the war threats in the Middle East uh, once again escalate these dangers. Uh, is there a way to deal with them? Yeah, there's a very straightforward way to mitigate or probably end uh, whatever threat Iran is alleged to pose, namely move towards establishing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Uh, that has enormous international support. It's been called for repeatedly by the UN Security Council. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are actually two countries that have a very special commitment to pursue this, uh, the United States and Britain. Uh, the reason is that when the US and Britain invaded Iraq 10 years ago, uh, they tried to provide a thin legal cover for the invasion. Uh, as you recall, they claimed that uh, Iraq had uh, weapons for, had, had programs to develop nuclear weapons, and they appealed to a UN resolution, Security Council resolution, the resolution 687 in uh, 1991, which uh, re uh, compelled Iraq to stop its programs of nuclear weapons development. 
That was the pretext for the war. Uh, we know what happened to the pretext, but much less discussed, in fact not discussed, is that same resolution, 687, that calls on all states to move uh, to uh, create a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. So the US and Brit Britain have a specific uh, commitment to this. The latest major UN resolution on Iranian nuclear weapons also uh, calls strongly for these moves. There's overwhelming international support, including even uh, a majority of the population in Israel. So far, it's been blocked by the United States, which insists that Israel must be excluded. There's an opportunity coming again this December when an international conference is scheduled under UN auspices on, uh, on uh, uh, moving towards a nuclear weapons-free zone. Unless there's a very large-scale public pressure, it's quite unlikely that anything will be done. But very few people are even aware of this. Press doesn't cover it. In the United States, at least, the matter's virtually never discussed. I can't be that confident about Europe, but I've never seen anything in the West generally, except for specialist journals. If you read specialist journals on arms control, they report it, but very few people read that. Uh, well, let's put these prospects aside, grim prospects, and turn to how the current world system developed since World War II, how it's changed over the years, and where things stand today. There's a very common theme. I'm actually quoting from the US Academy of Political Science, a common theme that uh, only a few years ago, America was hailed to stride the world as a colossus with unparalleled power and unmatched appeal, but it is now in decline, ominously facing the prospect of its final decay. Uh, the major establishment journal in the uh, Journal of Inter International Relations in the United States, uh, Foreign Affairs, Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, had an issue a few months ago where the front cover in big bold letters uh, featured the title of the issue. The title was, Is America Over? Uh, these themes are very widely believed and with some reason, uh, though some essential qualifications are in order, I think. Uh, the decline is real, but it's not recent. In fact, it's been proceeding since World War II. That's when U.S. power reached its highest point. It's been declining steadily since. Uh, there's a corollary that's commonly drawn, uh, namely that power will shift to China and India. That's highly dubious, I think. They're very poor countries, very severe internal problems. I don't have time to go into it, but can if you like. The world is surely becoming more diverse, but despite America's continued decline, uh, in the foreseeable future, there's no competitor for global hegemonic power. Uh, just to keep to one dimension, military power, uh, US military spending is almost the same as the rest of the world combined. And the US is technologically far more advanced. Uh, the US is alone in having military bases elsewhere, roughly a thousand military bases rigging the whole world. Uh, recently, uh, figures were announced on global arms sales. Uh, the United States holds three quarters of the global market. Uh, sales are more than 10 times as high as uh, second place Russia. And the military dimension is only one of many. Uh, so the decline is real, but the power remains overwhelming. Well, going back to the beginnings of the contemporary era, during World War II, the U.S. planners, President Roosevelt's planners, uh, recognized that the United States would emerge from the war in a position of overwhelming power. 
In fact, it's very clear from the documentary record that President Roosevelt was aiming at United States hegemony in the post-war world. I'm quoting the assessment of uh, a distinguished British diplomatic historian, uh, Jeffrey Warner. He's one of the most respected specialists on the topic and on the documentary evidence. And what he says is quite, quite well supported. Uh, plans were developed during, during the war, during the Second World War, to control what was called, what the planners called a grand area. Uh, the grand area was to include as a minimum the entire Western Hemisphere, of course, uh, the Far East and the former British Empire, which the US would take over, uh, in particular the crucial uh, Middle East uh, oil reserves, and also as much of Eurasia as possible. At the very least, it's core industrial regions in Western Europe and in the Southern European states, uh, Italy and Greece. Uh, Italy and Greece in the planning of the time were regarded as essential for ensuring control of Middle East energy resources which passed through the Mediterranean. And within these expansive domains, uh, the documents read, the United States was to maintain unquestioned power with military and economic supremacy uh, while ensuring the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with these global designs. Uh, these doctrines still prevail, though the capacity to implement them has sharply declined. Actually, we know quite a lot about the US internal planning. Uh, the reason is that the United States is an unusually free society, maybe unique, uh, and we have enormous access to internal records. A kind of a side complimentary comment is that the population is uh, saved from knowing anything about this because uh, surely the media, but even most scholarship, just ignore it, except for highly specialized scholarship. Uh, these. Uh, wartime plans were not at all unrealistic. For a long time, the United States had been far and away the richest country in the world, had unparalleled advantages, and in fact still is. The wartime, there was a huge government stimulus during the wartime, during the war, that ended the depression, and in fact U.S. industrial capacity uh, nearly quadrupled during the Second World War. And meanwhile, rival industrial powers were decimated. Uh, at the end of the war, the United States literally had half the world's wealth and unmatched security. There's never been a situation of global dominance anywhere near like that. Uh, there was a Cold War that followed. If you take a look at the actual events of the Cold War, uh, they consisted very largely of efforts by the two superpowers to enforce order in their own domains. Uh, for the Soviet Union, it was Eastern Europe, the traditional invasion corridor into Russia. Uh, for the United States, it was most of the world. Well, that was 1945. Uh, very quickly, the Grand Area began to erode the first blow, and a very serious one, was in 1949. There's a phrase to describe it. The routine phrase describing it is the loss of China. Uh, China moved towards independence. Uh, that had very severe domestic repercussions in the United States. Uh, one of the factors that led to what's called McCarthyism, uh, many accusations about who's to blame for the loss of China. Uh, that phrase, the loss of China, is interesting. Uh, one can only lose what one possesses. Like, I can lose my computer, I can't lose your computer. And it's taken for granted that the United States owns most of the world by right, so therefore if part of it becomes independent, we've lost it. And the question is, who's to blame for this loss? Well, shortly after, uh, 
Southeast Asia began to fall out of control, uh, leading to concern about further losses. And by 1950, the US had launched supporting France then on its own, what became Washington's horrendous Indochina wars and also uh, going on. Uh, another case was the huge massacres in Indonesia in 1965 as US dominance was restored, and many other cases. Meanwhile, subversion, uh, massive violence that continued elsewhere in the effort to maintain what's called stability, meaning conformity to US demands. Uh, Italy was not overlooked. Uh, 1948, as I'm sure you know, the United States intervened massively to try to ensure that it would maintain control of the political process in Italy. And in subsequent years, uh, Italy was the scene of uh, more CIA covert activity than any other country, at least until the 1970s. That's when the record runs dry. Uh, Nevertheless, decline was inevitable. The industrial world reconstituted, reconstructed, uh, decolonization proceeded, pursuing its agonizing course. Uh, by 1970, the US share of world wealth had declined to about 25%. That's still colossal, but much less than 50%. It's approximately what it still is. At that point, the industrial world was becoming what's called tripolar, three major centers, the United States, Europe, and Asia. Asia was then Japan-centered, already becoming the world's most dynamic uh, industrial region. Well, 20 years later, the Soviet Union collapsed. And for those who want to understand the reality of the Cold War, it's highly informative to look into what happened when it ended. It's a very natural place to look. That was the time of the first Bush administration, the civilized Bush. Uh, it was then in office. Uh, the Bush administration immediately declared officially that policies would remain pretty much unchanged, but with different pretexts. So the huge military establishment would, would be maintained but not for defense against the Russians, uh, rather to confront what they called the technological sophistication of third world powers. Uh, well, educated intellectuals don't laugh when they read that. Uh, similarly, it would be necessary to maintain what was called the defense industrial base. It's actually a euphemism for advanced industry, which is highly reliant on government subsidy and initiative. That's uh, contrary to free market delusions. Uh, what about intervention forces? Well, they still had to be aimed at the Middle East where the serious problems could not be laid at the Kremlin's door. It's the official wording. Notice that that quietly withdraws a half a century of deceit when it was claimed that the threat was the Russians. It was no longer possible to claim that. Uh, so it was conceded that the problems had always been what's called radical nationalism, that is attempts by countries to pursue an independent course in violation of grand area principles, analogous to uh, the Russian actions in their much more restricted domain, interventions in uh, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, and Poland for the US almost the whole world. Well, the principles were retained. Uh, they were not modified. In fact, the Clinton administration declared, and I'll quote its official comment, state position, declared that the United States has the right to use military force unilaterally to ensure uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources, and must have military forces forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to shape people's opinions about us, not by gentle persuasion, and to shape events that will affect our livelihood and our security. I'm quoting official 
documents of the Clinton era. Incidentally, that goes beyond anything claimed by his successor, George W. Bush. Uh, Bush's uh, proclamations aroused enormous uh, anger and concern. Uh, Clinton's much more extreme ones uh, were ignored because they were kind of presented politely and quietly, uh, and not uh, arrogantly. But the doctrines themselves were actually worse. Uh, one very instructive case is NATO. According to standard doctrine, the NATO was established to defend Europe, uh, defend it against the Russian hordes. Well, after 1989, no more Russian hordes. Uh, so therefore, if you believe the official doctrine, uh, NATO should have been uh, reduced or eliminated. On the contrary, the NATO was expanded to the east immediately in violation uh, of uh, verbal pledges to Mikhail Gorbachev uh, when he agreed, he did agree to allow a unified Germany to join NATO. That's an amazing concession on his part in the light of history, but there was a quid pro quo. He received a guarantee from uh, President Bush and his Secretary of State, James Baker, that NATO would not move one inch to the east. That was the phrase, meaning to East Germany or certainly not beyond. Uh, that was immediately violated. Uh, Gorbachev was naturally pretty upset, uh, but when he complained, uh, the US government uh, informed him that it had only been a verbal agreement, nothing on paper. And if he's naive enough to accept the uh, uh, promises of uh, an American administration, that's his problem. Uh, the, uh, by now, uh, NATO has become a global intervention force under US command. It has an official task, namely controlling the international energy system, sea lanes and pipelines, and in fact, whatever else the hegemonic power determines. Uh, there was a period of euf euphoria after the collapse of the superpower enemy. Excited tales about uh, the end of history, uh, the possibility at last of uh, uh, carrying out uh, humanitarian intervention, uh, the idealistic new world bent on ending inhumanity can uh, proceed guided by altruism and the principles and values. Uh, that's just a small sample of uh, the inspired rhetoric of prominent uh, European and American intellectuals. It's the 1990s. Uh, not everyone was so enraptured. The traditional victims, the Global South, bitterly condemned what they called the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, which they recognized just to be the old right of imperial domination. But as usual, they were ignored. Uh, after Bush number two took over, increasingly hostile world opinion could scarcely be ignored. Uh, particularly in the Arab world, Bush's approval ratings uh, plummeted. Uh, one of President Obama's most impressive feats is that he succeeded in becoming even more unpopular than Bush. Uh, his popularity is down to 5% in Egypt, not much higher elsewhere in the region. Considering the reaction to Bush, that's not a small accomplishment. Well, meanwhile, decline continued. Uh, in the past decade, South America has been lost. That's serious enough, but far more serious would be moves towards independence in the Middle East. Uh, planners of the 1940s recognized that control of the incomparable energy reserves of the Middle East would yield substantial control of the world. It's the words of the influential Roosevelt advisor, A. A. Burley, uh, and many, many others. It was standard view. And correspondingly, a loss of control would threaten the project of global dominance that was clearly articulated during World War II and has been sustained since. 
in the face of major changes in world order. Now, there's a further danger in the Middle East as elsewhere. There might be meaningful moves towards democracy, and that's a threat. And a, a look at uh, Western studies of public opinion in the Arab world, there are many of them, uh, and they're pretty consistent. Uh, that makes it very clear why democracy is a very severe threat. It has to be prevented as fully as possible. Uh, the United States and its Western allies do not want policies to be responsive to a public that sees Israel and the United States as the major threat, so severe a threat that many uh, think that the region would be better off if Iran had nuclear weapons. Now, that's not what the West wants, obviously. For the West, the most important states are the oil dictatorships in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. There, the uh, democratic uprisings have been brutally repressed with Western support and tolerance. Uh, elsewhere, particularly in Egypt, the main structure of the former military dictatorship remains partially intact. It's threatened by popular forces, and that's quite a serious concern in the West. This is different from official rhetoric, but official rhetoric uh, always has to be uh, regarded with extreme skepticism for obvious reasons. Well, control of the Middle East remains intact for the moment. Uh, nevertheless, American decline is continuing. And a significant element of it is that the decline is in no small, small measure self-inflicted. There's a recent study by the Economic Policy Institute in Washington. That's the major source of uh, regular information and analysis of the economy. Uh, their recent study is called Failure by Design. Uh, it reviews the data on the impact of the neoliberal policies from the past generation uh, that includes remarkable concentration of wealth while wages have stagnated or declined, uh, working hours have increased far beyond Europe, and the weak benefit system has been eroded. It is now further threatened. Now, the authors point out that the failure is class-based. The designers have achieved spectacular success. And they also stress that it is by design. Uh, alternative possible pol policies were always possible and still are, and though I won't go into it, the same is true of Europe. Uh, corporate power, just keeping to the United States for, for now, the corporate power is by now a largely financial capital. It's become so influential in the political system that by now both parties are well to the right of the population on major issues under debate. There are careful studies of this by major political scientists and they make it very clear that in the collapsing political system, the very rich, top few percent, uh, probably top one-tenth of one percent if you could adequate polling data, uh, the very rich uh, generally get what they want, uh, whatever the public might prefer. Uh, the most recent detailed study, major study by Martin Gillens, uh, shows that for about three quarters of the population, they are, in his words, powerless to shape government policy. Doesn't matter what they think. Uh, and the mechanisms are by no means obscure. However, it's fair to say that the U.S. Federal Reserve, the central bank, though heavily influenced by financial corporations, looks pretty progressive in comparison with the European Central Bank, its counterpart. The U.S. Fed, central bank, has a formal commitment to two tasks. One is keeping inflation from getting too high, and the second is reducing unemployment. Uh, that uh, uh, latter concern, 
uh, there is no threat of inflation, so it doesn't have to worry about that. The threat is deflation. The other commitment, reducing unemployment, it does receive some attention. It's why the Federal Reserve has been effectively printing money trying to uh, support a stimulus. The European Central Bank is quite different. Its only formal commitment is to keep inflation uh, low. It's for the benefit of bankers, uh, primarily the Bundesbank. Uh, that provides a welcome opportunity to dismantle the welfare state one of Europe's great contributions to civilization in the modern period. Uh, that's what we're seeing before our eyes. And uh, the European Central Bank President, uh, Mario Draghi, uh, knew exactly what he was saying when he informed the Wall Street Journal that, quoting him, the continent's traditional social contract is obsolete, not for any intrinsic reasons, but by design. Alternatives are possible. Uh, these self-inflicted blows in the United States, as in much of the West, are not a current innovation. They trace back to the 1970s when the national political economy uh, underwent major transformations. It brought to an end what's commonly called the golden age of capitalism, should be called state capitalism because of the massive state intervention. I'll keep here to the United States, but the process is international, uh, taking different forms in various parts of the state capitalist uh, world. There were two major processes. One was financialization, the second is offshoring of production. There were reasons but the policies that were adopted were by no means necessary. They reflected the increasing power of international corporate capital, increasingly financial. They also reflected the ideological triumph of what are called free market doctrines, uh, which were used to uh, translate it into policies of sharp decrease in taxes for the very rich in the corporate sector, the deregulation, the rules of corporate governance that were designed to allow salaries of top management to reach unprecedented heights and other such policy decisions. I stress again that the term free market is uh, more propaganda than reality. The rich in the corporate sector insist on a very powerful state, uh, one that intervenes radically uh, to distort markets in their interest, many examples. Well, the resulting concentration of wealth yielded automatically greater political power. Uh, that accelerated a vicious cycle that has led to extraordinary wealth for literally a tenth of 1% of the population. That's mainly a chairman of major corporations, uh, managers of hedge funds, and so on. Meanwhile, for the large majority, their real incomes have virtually stagnated, often declined. Well, in parallel, the cost of elections has skyrocketed. Right now, it's billions of dollars. Now, that drives both parties even deeper into corporate pockets where the money is. Uh, in the United States, in the current U.S. electoral force, it's reached the level of caricature, probably observing it. Uh, the post-Golden Age economy is actually enacting a nightmare which was envisaged by the classical economists, Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Uh, both Smith and Ricardo recognized that if British uh, of course concerned with Britain, if British merchants and manufacturers invested abroad and relied on imports, they would profit, but England would suffer. Uh, both of them hoped that these consequences would be averted by what's called home bias, a preference to do business in the home country and to see it grow, grow and develop. Uh, so therefore, 
as if by an invisible hand, England would be saved from the ravages of global markets. Actually, that's the only occurrence of the phrase, famous phrase, invisible hand in Adam Smith's classic Wealth of Nations. So it's kind of hard to miss. It's basically in the course of an argument against neoliberal globalization. Uh, his immediate successor, Ricardo, hoped that thanks to home bias, most men of property, I'm quoting him now, most men of property would be satisfied with a low rate of profits in their own country rather than seek a more advantageous employment for their wealth in foreign nations, the feelings that I should be sorry to see weakened. That's Smith and Ricardo. In the past 30 years, the masters of mankind, as Smith called them, have abandoned any sentimental concern for the welfare of their own societies, concentrating instead on short-term gain and huge bonuses, country be damned, as long as the powerful nanny state remains intact to serve their interests. Uh, the, there's a government insurance policy which is colloquially called too big to fail, meaning banks will be saved if they're too big, no matter what they do. Uh, that government insurance policy is estimated at about a $60 billion annual taxpayer gift to the biggest banks, and that's only one small illustration of the state subsidy to the rich and powerful. Uh, the emerging world order is very aptly described in a brochure for investors, which is produced by, which was produced a couple of years ago by Citigroup. The Citigroup's a huge bank that's been feeding at the public trough for 30 years in a cycle of risky loans, huge profits, crash, public bailout. It's happened again now, but it's been going on since the early 80s. Uh, the bank's analysts describe a world that's dividing into two blocks. Uh, one of them is what they call the plutonomy. Uh, the, uh, the rest is, and then there's the, the rest, the vast majority. Uh, sometimes they're called the global precariat, uh, those who live a precarious existence, uh, whether or not they're lucky enough to have employment. Uh, in the United States, they're subject to growing worker insecurity. That's the basis for a healthy economy, as Federal Reserve Chair uh, Alan Greenspan explained to Congress while lauding his performance in economic management during the Clinton years. Uh, that's the real shift in power in global society, and not to China and India, but to the global plutonomy. Uh, the Citigroup analysts in advise investors to focus on the very rich. That's where the action is. They have what they call a plutonomy stock basket, investments in uh, products and activities that benefit the tiny super rich. And they point out that their plutonomy stock basket has far outperformed the world index of developed markets since 1985. That's when the Reagan-Thatcher economic programs of enriching the very wealthy and punishing the rest were just taking off. Uh, before the 2007 crash, for which they were largely responsible, the financial institutions of the neoliberal failure by design had gained startling economic power. They had more than tripled their share of corporate profits. Uh, after the crash, a number of economists for the first time began to inquire into their function in purely economic terms, something that amazingly had never been done before. Uh, one Nobel laureate in economics, uh, Robert Solow, MIT, he concludes from a study that the general impact of financial institutions is probably negative, they're harmful. 
quoting him, the successes probably add little or nothing to the, in, to the efficiency of the real economy, while the disasters transfer wealth from taxpayers to financiers. Uh, the most respected financial correspondent in the English-speaking world, Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times, writes that the out-of-control financial sector is eating out the modern market economy from inside, just as the larva of the spider wasp eats out the host in which it has been laid. But it's a great success for the fraction of 1% of the population who are the designers of the current system and not surprisingly its beneficiaries. Well, by shredding the remnants of political democracy, they also lay the basis for carrying the lethal process forward and will continue to do so as long as their victims are willing to suffer in silence. 